On April 16, 1843, a man by the name of Robert Wiley began an excavation of an Indian burial mound near Kinderhook, Illinois. He had had the same dream three nights in a row that had told him he should dig there. The work was very labor-intensive, so he hired several men to assist him in the dig. They dug a shaft about 10 feet into the ground before discovering a skeleton and other artifacts underneath a limestone cover. Among the artifacts were a set of six bell-shaped brass plates covered in unknown symbols. One of the men present was a member of the church and expressed great excitement when the plates were pulled from the earth. Word spread quickly to the prophet Joseph Smith and the plates were sent for so he could examine them. When Joseph saw the plates, he had them sent to the antiquarian societies at Philadelphia, France, and England. They informed him that if the language was genuine, it was a dead one, and it was unknown to them. Satisfied, Joseph began to translate the plates. Through various publications, he reported, I have translated a portion of the plates and find they contain the history of the person with whom they were found. He was a descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven and earth. As with other quotes taken from the prophet, this quote was taken down by Joseph's closest friend and scribe, William Clayton, who had spent the entire day in the prophet's home, sealing him to one of his plural wives and speaking with him about the plates, which were on display in his home. This statement, along with other statements about the plates, was published in the form of a broadside in the Times and Seasons, along with a promise to publish the translation once it had been completed. It was speculated that this translation would form the next Book of Mormon scripture, a book comparable to the Book of Mormon in importance. Unfortunately, Joseph was murdered before a full translation could be completed, and any translation manuscript which he may have produced has been lost. In 1879, a man named Wilbur Fugit claimed in a letter to a Mr. Cobb that he had forged the plates in order to hoax the church. I received your letter in regard to those plates and will say in answer that they are a humbug, gotten up by Robert Wiley, Bridge Witten, and myself. We read in Pratt's prophecy that truth is yet to spring out of the earth. We concluded to prove the prophecy by way of a joke. We soon made our plans and executed them. Our plans worked admirably. Members of the church dismissed Mr. Fugit's claim, believing the claim itself to be a hoax. For the next 100 years, the plates remained a source of faith for the church, lending credence to the Book of Mormon and Joseph's gift of translation, and continued to be used in church publications for these reasons. In 1920, a surviving plate was found by the Chicago Historical Society. The September 1962 edition of the Improvement Era published photos of the plate, along with an article stating that the plate was genuine and proved Joseph was a prophet and seer. In 1966, this remaining plate was tested at Brigham Young University, but the tests were inconclusive. In 1980, Professor D. Lynn Johnson of the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at Northwestern University examined their surviving plate. He used microscopy and various scanning devices and determined that the tolerances and composition of its metal proved that it was forged in a 19th century blacksmith shop. He also found traces of nitrogen in the hieroglyphs, evidence of nitric acid etching, which would not have been used anciently. This corroborated the letter written by Mr. Fugit in 1879, which described nitric acid etching as the method for inscribing the plates. In 1981, the church was forced to admit that the plates were a hoax. They now deny that Joseph had been fooled into making a false translation, and insist that he had no interest in the plates, claims which are unsupported and in fact refuted by the historical record. <laughs>